OIS podcast audience. Nice to be speaking with you again. Uh, For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rob Rothman. I am a clinically practicing ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist by training in New York. Um, I spend about 50% of my time uh, in active patient management, both medical and surgical. Uh, The other half of my time I spend running in Focus Capital Partners, which is an ophthalmic specific venture capital fund. Um, We closed our first fund about a year ago with uh, 12 assets strictly in ophthalmology. We're gearing up for the launch of our second fund and uh, obviously keep everybody updated on the progress of that. Today, I am privileged to be speaking to somebody who I've been wanting to speak to for a very long time, uh, who's had a significant impact on my clinical life and maybe in my future investing life, we'll see. Um, But today we have Mark Baum, who is the founder chairman of the board and CEO of Harrow. Um, And for those of you in the ophthalmology community who don't know what Harrow is, um, you are probably very familiar with Imprimis. So Harrow, the former Imprimis, although Imprimis is a clinical entity within Harrow. So we'll get to all that discussion. But Mark, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Um, And uh, we're looking forward to gaining some significant insight from you over the next 30 minutes or so. Great. Good to speak with you, Rob. Save the date as OIS returns to San Diego on December 1st and 2nd. Our 13th flagship summit unites corporate, clinical, and capital leaders driving novel therapies for both the front and back of the eye and focuses on addressing unmet needs across all of ophthalmology and optometry. Head over to OIS.net and click on events for more information. Your path to innovation begins here. It's funny, um, you know, for Mark, Mark and I just had a, a chat before the this to, um, you know, sort of get a little bit acquainted because we haven't had the opportunity to meet in person before. And uh, I kind of feel like we did we did the whole podcast. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't record it, so we're going to try and get through all of it again right now. But um, I think everybody's going to be really interested to hear um, from the CEO of one of the um, fastest growing, I would say, ophthalmic uh, pharmaceutical companies out there. So um, uh, again, Mark, thanks again. I, can you, I, this is going to kind of my style, but I think it's really important for people to know a little bit about you on a personal level, sort of where you grew up, where you came from, what your educational background is, uh, stuff like that, just so they, so they know who you are. Sure. I'm, I'm 51 years old. Uh, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and uh, I'm the son of a merchant. Uh, I went to college in Arlington, Texas, at the University of Texas at Arlington, got a degree in political science and philosophy, and went to law school in San Diego, and uh, was a member of the California Bar, was also a member of the Texas Bar, but really didn't like the practice of law, and practiced for a very short period of time, and wanted to get back into business. I'd been interested in business since I was a little kid, and as I said, I'm the son of a merchant, and, uh, you know, always been an entrepreneur and ever since I was trading baseball cards was on when I was a little kid and excited to get back into business when I left the practice of law um, and ultimately formed the company we'll talk a lot about today. I'm married. I have two kids. Um, my wife is a former Navy officer. She did a uh, residency in ophthalmology at Balboa Navy Hospital in San Diego, which is where we met. And she began that residency before I met her. So that's a little bit about me. Got it. So Texas Rangers or San Diego Padres or what's the team? My hero growing up was Earl Campbell and Nolan Ryan. I was an Astros fan and uh, Oilers. Oilers. Love you, Blue. Bum Phillips, Dan Pastorini, Kenny Stabler. There you go. All right. That's my, that's my generation too. Um, so, so that's great. Thank you for that. How did you end up in ophthalmology, except for the fact that you met your wife who was an ophthalmologist? I mean, you jumped from law into corporate activity and, you know, for people who are going to hopefully look you up after this podcast, your corporate experience is pretty unbelievable in the pharma world. So how did that all get started? We, uh, so I ended up going to a charity event in San Diego and I met the former CEO of what is now Harrow. The company was in bankruptcy at the time, and there was an opportunity to pull the company out of bankruptcy, restructure it, reorganize it, recapitalize the business. And uh, so I did that with Andrew Boll, who is our CFO. Um, I've worked for, with Andrew for over 15 years. He was the accountant for my hedge fund. So we had a longstanding relationship. 
and he and I jumped into it and began the process of creating what is what is now Harrow. Harrow uh, today is very different than how it started. It has been a tortuous path to get here. It has not been a straight line. So we talk about that on our corporate website. We lay out the history of the company. Uh, but uh, frankly, I confirmed my uh, my belief that ophthalmology would be a great place as a business um, through the advice and counsel of my beautiful and brilliant wife. So she uh, was able to, to let me know that the first product that we were looking to acquire would in fact be impactful if it worked really well or as well as the inventor said. And so uh, I have to give a lot of credit to my wife for getting me into I ophthalmology. Do- I will do everything in my power to make sure she hears this podcast. So don't worry. <laughs> we'll send it in a, you know, special disc for her, you know, so she can. Sure. Play it. Um, so, so you saw the business opportunity. You ended up in a serendipitous situation where you you learn about a company that has ophthalmic assets that you could potentially restructure and you go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. We jumped into it. Um, as I said, we were not, we're not an ophthalmology company at the beginning. Um, it took, you know, a few years to really hone in on ophthalmology as the focus for our company. That happened in 2014. Uh, we started the business in 2011, so uh, it was a it was a few years. So tell me about all the other companies. So t- so what was the name of that company that you that you inherited, basically? Transdell Pharmaceuticals, which became Imprimis Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is now Harrow. Right. So and. You know, you basically started from zero, right? So it's uh, used, I mean, pretty much zero. Well, when you're when you're rehabbing a, a a busted company, you're actually, I think, in many ways, starting with less than zero. Right, but... Less than zero, okay, could be. So, and then I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the current market cap of Harrow is just north of five hundred million. Is that correct? Yeah, I think our enterprise okay. value is about. Uh, you know, 750 million or so. 750 million. So from zero to $750 million market cap. So there's a lot of steps in there. Obviously, I don't think we have in, in 25 minutes the ability to go through it all, but there's a lot of um, product growth in there. And um, there have been a lot of corporate entities that have become part of Harrow over the course of time. And so maybe you could just explain to people what Harrow is in, in general, what you do now. For those of you, for those of the audience who aren't familiar with with Harrow's product, and, and what your sort of corporate philosophy is regarding the products that you provide, yeah. So Harrow, first of all, is is a consortium of of entrepreneurs. Um, I get to be the CEO. I'm the chairman and founder, but there are other entrepreneurs here that have helped build this business. So I, I like to refer to our team as the Harrow family. So the Harrow family over the last decade or so has helped really build this business um, based on a core interest in entrepreneurship. Um, And that really is sort of taking a sow's ear and turning it into a purse. Um, We didn't start with much, no products, no customers. Um, And as I said, we went through a tortuous path to get to where we are now. Um, The first place that we started in the uh, ophthalmic world is the same place that two of my favorite companies in the ophthalmic pharma space also started. Uh, Both Alcon and Allergan started the exact same way that we did as a compounding focused company. Um, And they evolved into these really important businesses over many decades. So we too uh, started off in in the world of compounding. There are four types of pharmaceutical products in the US market, branded, generic, over-the-counter and compounded. Compounded products are not FDA approved. They're sort of the ugly redheaded stepchild of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, But that's where we got started, Um, listening to doctors who had unmet needs. And we built products to solve those needs. And when we did so, and the physicians had success, they told their friends and it grew and grew into, uh, you know, several dozen SKUs. Um, in the compounding world um, and in, our, in the compounding part of our business, which is, as you mentioned, Imprimis RX. Um, and then, you know, at some point, you know, we we looked at our customer base. We had more than 10,000 customers from zero. And we said, how can we best serve these these customers? They, they wanted more than just our Imprimis RX compounded formulations. 
And so that's when we began to, to branch out and look beyond uh, compounding. But as you mentioned, along the way, curiously, um, as we've built the business, capitalized it uh, appropriately, you know, we've had assets that we were really excited about that we either didn't have the expertise to develop, we didn't have the capital to develop, um, but yet those assets deserved to be developed. They deserved attention. And so we have built three other companies um, and we've taken assets that are under the Harrow umbrella, uh, put them into those entities, capitalized the businesses uh, externally and found discrete management teams to operate those businesses. So we started Eaton Pharmaceuticals, which is a NASDAQ listed company. Um, they're focused on rare diseases. We have a great CEO running that company. I used to serve on the board and, and no longer do, uh, but Harrow owns a, a nice chunk of that company. We started Surface Ophthalmics with Dick Lindstrom. Uh, Cameron Hosseini is the CEO there. Um, Andy Corley's on our, our board and a number of other wonderful uh, folks that people know, Adrian Graves and, and, and others, um, Perry Sternberg. Uh, but that business, once again, externally funded, externally managed, Harrow owns a chunk of it. And then finally, uh, John Berdahl called me up one day and had this amazing idea, along with Bill Wiley, to change how ophthalmic uh, surgical patients were sedated. And so we built a compounded product called the MKO Melt that's been used in hundreds of thousands of cataract surgeries. And we decided to fund a company called Melt Pharmaceuticals uh, to bring that product through a traditional drug development process to ultimately uh, have an FDA approved version of their idea. So uh, we've started Impermis RX, we've started Eaton, Surface and Melt. We maintain ownership interests in all those businesses. But what I do day to day is manage Hero, and uh, we're 100% all in focused on the US market, ophthalmic only and uh you know we're pharma only yeah so it's amazing i mean it's an amazing story and and you know again you it's it's funny to hear the the process in a short condensed version like that but i can think about the amount of work and effort it goes into identifying an asset building it into its own company funding it and then get it get it produced out in the world it's a little bit more daunting than you make it sound which is fun to hear but you know i start to shake when i hear about all the work that you probably had to go through to get those get those I used assets to, yeah you, i used to know. be six foot four and i had a big <laughs> head of hair now i'm going bald i'm gray and i'm i've lost four inches <laughs> that's pretty funny i would imagine that's kind of how i feel sometimes although i think sometimes i'm going the other way you know on the expanding side but another, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's another story um um you you just briefly, you also have a finance background to some degree. I mean, most people, I think you, you know, sort of highlighted your legal career, but you've worked in the investment side of, of life as well, correct? Yeah, I, that's what I did for a number of years, actually. I got out of law school, passed the bar, owed a bunch of money, and uh, figured out a way to quickly and legally pay off my debt and did so and then got into business. I found somebody that uh, was able to... Uh, was willing to fund uh, an idea that I had, you know, when I was in my twenties. And um, anyway, I made enough money through that venture to start a fund and uh, I acted as a principal investor, uh, managing my own money um, and investing in private and public companies, buying equity, buying debt, uh, you know, all sorts of anything I could really shoot my way out of, frankly, and uh, did that for a number of years before uh, we started uh, Harrow. Got you. So you so you have a combination of legal and 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 finance, which I think is sort of a common thread throughout a lot of the you know interviews I've done with successful CEOs is that you have sort of an understanding of the basic fundamental workings. It's not, you know, I, I think a lot of people associate you know startups um, with scientists only, and it's not really the case. There's a lot of people who understand things. Um, from a different perspective and there's ways to do that. We have a portfolio company that I'm very fond of called IACTA. I don't know if you know Damon Burroughs, but similar concept guy who understands how to manipulate um, pharmaceutical assets, but as necessarily a science guy. And I, I think there's multiple paths towards success here, but in, interesting to hear that that's yours as well. 
why do you think you've been able to become so successful? I mean, you know, I, I, when, when I think if you ask the entire, um, non, let's say investment savvy side of ophthalmology, who the big players in ophthalmic pharma are, you would probably not be there right in that list. I think, right. I, th- I mean, I'm not in an insulting way. I think people think of Allergan and Alcon and b and and J&J and Santon and all these companies, but yet you guys are growing, you know, I think your stock price is up 700% over the course of, you know, time over recent time and, and the, and the, the, the revenue and, and you've just been able to grow sort of exponentially. Why do you, why has that happened? How has that occurred in the presence of all these giant monster ophthalmic pharmaceutical companies out there? Well, first of all, thank you for saying we're successful. I don't, I, I'm a glass, when it comes to the, the business itself, I'm a glass half empty guy. I, I don't look at what we've necessarily a, accomplished. I'm, I'm looking at what, what I believe we can accomplish. So um, I don't know that I would call us necessarily successful. I guess we have survived and grown and, and we are thriving. It's, we've never been in as good a shape as we are right now. So that, that I think is exciting and, and, and looking forward to talking about the future because you know, we have a lot of interesting things going on with the business, but I love the fact that um, when people think of ophthalmic pharma, they think of Alcon and Allergan and, and all these wonderful companies, Bausch and Loam included, um, and they don't know who Harrow is. Now, truthfully, uh, we aim to change that. We're going through the process of getting out there and talking more about Harrow. Um, I think two or three years from now, uh, name recognition will be very different than it is today as it relates to Harrow. But anyone listening to this podcast may not know Harrow, but you likely know Imprimis RX, but you definitely know other brands that we own. You know Alevro, you know Triessence, you know Vigamox, uh, you know Maxitrol, you know um, some of these branded products that, that we own. And um, those are all assets that we've acquired. We've done five deals in the last couple of years. We're kind of filling this void. A lot of folks are leaving uh, the ophthalmic pharma market and we love the ophthalmic market and we're getting deeper into it. And, um, but, you know, nobody really knows our name and we think that'll change in the next couple of years though. Well, it's good. I mean, staying below the radar is probably going to help you in some in some regard. But it's just amazing because, again, you know, we we had a brief chance to discuss this, but on the investment side, you know, I think you look at this and you called it a void, and I think we all agree it's a void where there seems to be this sort of, um, you know, incremental innovation, sort of lack of imagination, um, and and uh, a different set of rules governing how bigger pharmaceutical companies look at the ophthalmology space and you know it's it's probably not the it's probably not the right analogy but you sort of look at it and say well someone's garbage is someone else's treasure right you know you look at the amount of revenue that you're able to generate from sort of market segments that have been partially abandoned by larger pharmaceutical companies and here you are growing unbelievably well so that that void is is fascinating um as an investor you know for me as an investor and and i think that you know there's got to be some um ability for let's say entrepreneurs innovators out there to look at a company like Harrow and say hey even if big you know the big boys aren't necessarily looking for something like this maybe or haven't telegraphed that they're looking for something like this is there another potential acquiring partner or somebody who's interested in development out there. And I get the sense that that may be you as an I, example. Right. We, well, we see a lot of deals. I think we see just about, you know, much of what is available uh, in the market. We've been very active. I think, I think uh, folks know that we know how to transact. We know how to close. Um, we don't waste time. We don't participate in processes. There's a lot of beauty contests with assets and, you know, we really don't do that. Uh, um, it's not really productive. I, I'm a big Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger fan. And I like to think that a deal can be struck over a bottle of wine or a six pack of beer, whichever you choose. But um, so we, we, we know how to get deals done and we kind of know what we're looking for, what the profile of what we're looking for is. Um, and it's a very interesting time to to be in in uh, at Harrow. 
um, given you know what's transpiring in the market and, and uh, you know who's as I said leaving, um, who's stagnant, dormant, whatever you want to call it, and and then uh, we are definitely not. We are active. But why don't you can you can you talk a little bit about some of the most recent products or the most recent acquisitions, some of the things that you're doing that you know I'm aware of and 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 I think some people are aware of, but that are most exciting to you about what's coming what's coming down the pike. Yeah, I mean there there are the legacy assets, the, the assets that we we acquired, um, and you know even this kind of relates to your last question, um, you know what's what's so attractive about Alevro or you know, why would, uh, you know, Novartis, for example, sell some of these assets, Triessence or, or, or others? Um, and the reality is what we found is, is that these bigger companies, um, you know, a hundred million dollar product or a two hundred million dollar product, a 50 million dollar product, certainly even a five hundred million dollar product just doesn't move the needle for them. Uh, when you when you think about. Uh, Humira is an example. You think about a $20 billion product that is essentially uh, going to be challenged. And how do you make up $20 billion of revenue if you're one of these monster companies? Um, you can't do it $100 million at a time. You can't do it even $500 million at a time. You need billion, multi-billion dollar big giant products. And there are very few of those in, in the ophthalmic world. Now, if you're Harrow and you're a small company, um, we love those assets. Uh, we we uh, we like them all day long, especially when we can buy them right, um, and we like them for other reasons. These are important assets to customers. We not only want to create value for stockholders, for sure. We want to build a great company that we can be proud of that our our uh, the Harrow family loves coming to work for, but we also I think critically, and this is what we live for. This is why we exist. We exist to take care of consumers, patients. We exist to partner with uh, eye care professionals, whether they're ophthalmologists or optometrists. So um, we don't lose sight of that. And we can do that with the assets that we've recently acquired. We did two deals with Novartis. We did the first deal to just kind of create a relationship with them and, and make sure that they knew we could transact and and uh, that that we could get through their process. So we bought Iopidine, Maxitrol, Moxesa, and then we ultimately concluded a, a second deal with Novartis to acquire Vigamox, uh, Maxidex, uh, Triessence, Alevro, and Nevenac. Uh, bought a product from a company called Synthetic, a Swiss company, hundred year old company. Uh, it is uh, the product is Ihezo. Ihezo is the only uh, J-coded topical anesthetic in the U.S. market, so it's the only reimbursable topical anesthetic. And we just launched that a couple of months ago. It's a, amazing. The, the anecdotal feedback from clinicians has been outstanding. Those who have used the product. Um, you you mentioned uh, during our our pre discussion that. We acquired much of the North American portfolio of Santen. So we bought Tobert XST and Vercasia, Zerviate, Fresh Coat, Nadison, uh, and Flarex. We love Flarex. It's a great yeah. product. It's a good product. Um, and then probably the, the, the deal that we did that I'm most excited about is the most recent transaction. And that was with a company called Novalik. Um, they have developed this water-free technology, the ability to, I think, really change the game in the topical eyedrop market. Um, and they had a uh, an asset that they developed called Vivi. It's FDA approved. It has a, uh, a label for both the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. We love the dry eye market. We understand that market, I think, very well. I've been studying it uh, for years now. We've accumulated a lot of consumer data uh, that that, that we're leveraging. Um, but the this product, uh, Vivi, which we're going to launch in a couple of months, is going to really change the game, I think, in, in uh, dry eye disease. And there's a sister product, a sort of uh, a very similar uh, chemistry uh, that Bausch & Lohm has uh, for their Mybo product. They're both water-free technologies. They're the only two water-free products that will be in the U.S. market this year. 
So we're really excited about uh, bringing Vivi to market uh, here shortly. And so it's uh, amazing. I mean, yeah, I, I would agree with you that dry eye space is a, it's, it's, um, I don't know, you probably have spoken to um, significantly larger sources of funding than I have. Um, but when you talk about dry eye, the majority of the investment community is like, is that like a big market? Do people care about dry eye? I think, I think there's a general, under, you know, lack of understanding as to how significant uh, the potential is in, in the dry eye space. Um, kind of been relatively unserved up to this point. All we've really had is topical cyclosporin um, and we need other stuff, right? So we it's, need lots yeah. of other stuff. It's an, it is a huge market. It's highly underserved. Um, and I think it's just wide open. Um, yeah, it, is it is absolutely yeah. wide open and, uh, it needs a, a winning product, something that, you know, I think Vivi will offer. I think Mybo will be a, a really good product as well, but it's going to be tough. I think selling, uh, some of these legacy products that burn and sting and right. cause dyskusia and all this other stuff. It's going to be tough when I think uh, these water-free products hit the market. Yep, I agree. So I think if you look at the trajectory of your company and you know where I think a, a lot of people think you will be down the road, you know, one of the questions that's come up, um, I guess, in discussions inside the relatively tight um, early investment community in ophthalmology is whether you guys will ultimately develop your own products and you know, whether it's, it's your model of previously has been sort of to acquire assets. How about to develop assets? Do you ever see Harrow as somebody who gets involved at, you know, the, let's say phase two data point where there's something really exciting in a space you're interested in and somebody approaches you, do you foresee any involvement with companies earlier and potentially releasing something completely novel on your own? Yeah. So, well, uh, first of all, we, we would do that sort of three different ways. Um, in a way, we're already doing that. Um, we uh, have created and funded and now hold the commercial rights, uh, first refusal and the commercial rights to MELT, which I mentioned earlier. MELT is a sublingual sedation uh drug candidate and it's going to enter phase three in the first quarter of next year we're going we're actually completing the financing for that that uh phase three to nda process in the next month or so but um so we're doing it there you know that is a non-approved asset uh i would also say that there are compounded products that we've built um, that we sell as non-fda approved formulations that we would love to take through an FDA approval process. So, um, you know, recently we we created a product, a compounded product called Fortisite. It's a combination of tobramycin and vancomycin. And, you know, if you've got uh, a, a serious infection that comes in your office on a Friday, uh, this is a, a formulation that a lot of doctors choose to prescribe or offer. And uniquely, it is uh, refrigeration stable. And so doctors for the first time have a fortified antibiotic compounded uh, product available that they can stock and take care of the patient when they present. Um, but uh, so that's innovation that we would love to take through a traditional FDA approval process. It, it's a compounded product now, but we've envisioned that that formulation eventually, uh, hopefully making it as an FDA approved product. As we become more successful, and as we are able to take greater risks and have more capital to do that, um, I do absolutely believe, and it is in our five-year planning cycle, this, this five-year planning cycle, which just began uh, in, in January, to develop and invest in a pipeline. Um, so I, I think three or four years from now, we will be uh, serious players you know, on those types of assets, more development stage assets, as we can afford to do so. Well, I think on that note, uh, on behalf of, you know, every entrepreneur I've ever met uh, who's looking into the development of pharmaceuticals, they're all very happy right now <laughs> to know that there's somebody or at least a company out there that's that's looking to 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 grow in that space. As, as we sort of mentioned, the strategic landscape has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, and part of the void that has allowed you to, I think, expand and grow so successfully 
or kind of successfully, I don't want to freak you out a little bit, um, has, is, is, you know, sort of muddied the picture for a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs and scientists who have what they believe are important products and don't know where to go with them. So, you know, Harrow, you know, Thea, Dompe, companies that are looking to grow and expand their businesses in ophthalmology, I think it's encouraging to see that, or at least to hear that part of your strategy going forward is to potentially support some of these products. Um, you, 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 have the yeah. you have to, you have to, there, there is a, uh, there's sort of a moral imperative that we use uh, the capital, part of the capital that that we hopefully, you know, will build to invest um, in not only assets that we have, but in assets that we hope to have um, to to uh, expand the science and to provide better solutions for our customers. So. You know, we own Triessence. It's been on drug shortage for five years. Yeah. Well, don't think, and I said this in my last stockholder letter, we are going to adjust the price there. It has not seen a price adjustment in more than a dozen years. So what are we going to do with any any uh, capital that we uh, make on that price? adjustment? We're going to invest in the product to make sure that our customers have access to it, that it isn't on the drug shortage list. And so we'll do that with products like Triassins, but we're going to do that with innovative products, the kinds that, you know, your firm is investing in and, and many others. It's a, there's a moral imperative that we do that to advance the science and also maintain our credibility in this market. Well, listen, I got to tell you, as we, you know, it's sort of running out of time here that it's very refreshing. I mean, you know, I think a lot of the uh, investor side of the world thinks that we are trying to fulfill that moral imperative by looking to uh, fund and help develop products that are necessary for patients in ophthalmology. It's incredibly gratifying to hear there's CEO out there who's got the same attitude. Um, maybe there is good in the world after all. I think on behalf of the entire OIS podcast audience, I want to thank you for your candor um, and for your continued commitment to the care of ophthalmic disease. And uh, I think we're all looking forward to having another podcast in the next, you know, year or two to see how much you've grown between now and then. So um, thanks again for all your time and um, continuing to hope for great success for your company. Thank you very much, Rob. I mean, vision care, eye care, it's a righteous and impactful cause. So we're, yeah. we're grateful to be a part of this community. And we hope more of you learn more about Harrow over the coming years. Thanks so much. Mark Baum, thank you again for your time and to the entire OIS podcast audience. Uh, looking forward to the next time we get to speak together. 